The interaction between the environment and peoples throughout the world affects the quality of life on this planet. As citizens of our community, we can participate in decisions impacting our city, state, and nation. In this series, we explore the effects of our influence on the Earth's ecosystems, as well as alternatives and solutions. This is Eco News with your host, Nancy Perlman. Our program today is about the Sierra Nevada mountain range. But before we join my guest, a brief news report from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. One, two, three, cut. One, two, three. Yay! The folks in Bastrop have something to celebrate a new paddling trail on the Colorado River. The trail has public access points to put in and take out kayaks and canoes. There are also riverbank signs, maps, and details on the web. It's a great day for Bass Drop. We've been planning on this for about a year and a half now. Getting folks on the river is the goal of Texas Parks and Wildlife's statewide paddling trail program. Adios. See ya. We feel it's really important to get people out on the river. They love it once they get out on it, and it gives families a chance to get out and do something that they maybe haven't tried before. There's lots of really neat stretches in Texas, but a lot of people just don't know about them. With Texas being privately owned, there's not, not many access points, and they don't really know about that unless someone provides that information, gives them a chance to go out there on the water, and uh, I think once, once they've done it, they'll be hooked on it like I am. Man, it's beauty mess out here. Communities like Bastrop hope that the paddling trails will bring in tourist dollars. I can't think of a better way to invigorate a local economy than to have uh, visitors come and spend time with us and spend money with us. The Bastrop Paddling Trail is about six miles long and is one of three trails planned for the lower Colorado River. Come to the Colorado River, it's good mojo. For Texas Parks and Wildlife, this is Lydia Saldana. My guest is Tim Palmer, nature writer and photographer. He has written many books, including Rivers of America, Pacific High, California Wild, and Trees and Forests of America. One of his most recent books is Luminous Mountains, the Sierra Nevada of California. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Nancy, it's great to be here. You have created another gorgeous, fabulous art photo book about a beautiful mountain range in California. What is the specialness of the Sierra Nevada? You know, Nancy, the Sierra are uh, simply the greatest mountain range in America, according to many people. It's, they run for 400 continuous, unbroken miles of high country from the Cascade Mountains down to the Tehachapi Mountains in Southern California. It's a place where conservation in America was born with the creation of Yosemite National Park, Sequoia National Park, with John Muir's great battle to try to save the Tuolumne River in Hetch Hetchy Valley. It's a place where millions of people go for recreation, for escape from the civilized technological world. But most of all, it's a, a place of wildlands where there are these remarkable communities of life that, uh, that survive there and thrive there because of the remoteness of the area and, and the protection of the land that, that, uh, that has occurred. I know I've climbed over 75 of the listed peaks, and there are so many hundreds, if not thousands, of more peaks and ridges and places that one can get up to, over 14,000 feet high, too. There's a lot of high country. That's what the Sierra is really known for, is this spectacular high mountain country, the big clean sheets of granite, the snow fields of the Sierra. But it's also a remarkable region of great forests. The, uh, John Muir called it the greatest conifer forest in the world. Unfortunately, today, only 25% of that is left uncut. But that 25% is still quite remarkable. And it's a range of spectacular rivers, 25 major rivers flowing off these mountains, fed by the abundant snowfall there. We get up to 12 feet of accumulated snow by the end of each winter. All that snow melts into this amazing system of rivers. The rivers, the forests, the mountains themselves, and the borderlands, too, are, are remarkable for their communities, uh, their ecological communities. The western side of the mountains borders on the uh, foothills, of the Central Valley in California. 
the eastern side goes down to the Great Basin Desert. The southern end of the mountains adjoins the Mojave Desert. So all combined, this creates a remarkable diversity of life and, and natural environment. And you captured it so beautifully with different pictures. Close-ups are absolutely stunning, as well as the color, the light, the formations. All of it is spectacular. And most of the book, your new one, has new pictures. But you also went back into your archives. You have one shot that you basically can't get anymore because the area has been flooded. That's, that's right, yes. Most of the photos I did take while I was working on this book in a two-year period, uh, while I was taking pictures and writing this particular book. But you're absolutely right. I was able to call on experience that goes back to the late 1960s. The photo you mentioned is of the Stanislaw River. This was really the last great dam fight in American history. During the, uh, the era of big dam construction, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, New Malonis Dam on the Stanislaw was planned and construction was begun. A group called Friends of the River was formed in California to try to stop the construction of this dam because it was essentially unneeded and would flood an amazing wild canyon. And river rafters certainly enjoyed this very That's special right. stretch. That's right. It was the most floated white water in the West at the time. It was the deepest limestone canyon on the West Coast. And so I went there. I heard about their uh, effort to try to save this river in the late 1970s. And I went there actually to write magazine stories about what Friends of the River was doing. So I took a lot of pictures then of the river when it was still flowing. As it turned out, Friends of the River lost that battle to try to save their place. So sad. They had to watch the floodwaters rise foot by agonizing foot, covering up everything they had known of this beautiful place. And, uh, but I was able to cap capture a lot of pictures on film, and, uh, and one of those is in the new book, just to give people a sense of, of what can be lost if we're not always vigilant about protecting our natural environment. What I enjoyed was your artistic eye of what may be commonplace to some, but you took a different angle. Ansel Adams, of course, is famous for his Yosemite pictures in black and white, but you took some pictures of some of the same formations, but from a different location and in color. I really work on the, uh, the diversity of views. Yes, one photo. Uh, I was on one of the rivers at just a, uh, in just a gentle riffle, and I thought, how am I going to get a picture here? I ended up lying down on my stomach in the shallow water with the camera just a few inches above the water to get a different perspective. You know, I climb the peaks, obviously, because I, I love to climb, but mainly I love to see the mountains, to see what I can see from up there and to see what the rest of California looks like. So I get the high views, the, the views from the river, I love to explore the forest and get those details, those intimate details of forest life. You've seen quite a bit because you've hiked probably thousands of miles, but what is it like when you went with your wife for 400 miles carrying not just your food for an extended period of time, but all the camera equipment, the tripod? It, it was really hard, but, but it was really amazing too. Anne and my wife Anne and I, had long wanted to take a, uh, an extended Sierra trip where we would go out there in the wilds and not come back anytime soon. And so uh, while I was working on the book, the summer of 2006, we launched a 400 mile backpack trip from Donner Pass down through the Sierra, southward through the Sierra. And it was just one of the most amazing experiences that both of us ever had. Day after day, we were treated to that amazing Sierra light, that beautiful golden light early in the day and late in the day. Of course, we had, the, uh, we had to carry everything that we had, you know, which was about 50 pounds a piece. I had 15 pounds of camera gear alone. And of course, food for about a week and the other. We needed a lot of clothes because it was cold at night. We needed ice axes because there were steep snow fields that we had to cross, and you can't do that safely without an ice axe. We carried ski poles also to help us in places like that. 
And so day after day, you know, it, it was difficult, but it was incredibly rewarding. It, it happened to be one of the really biggest snow years in recent times. 200% normal snowpack. That's so quite when, a lot. That's a lot of extra snow. So when we started in uh, early June, it was, we couldn't even find the trail a lot of the time for the first couple of weeks of the trip. And then, of course, because it was a big snow year, there was a lot of, there were a lot of down timber that you'd have to climb through, a lot of snow fields you'd have to climb up and down. The, uh, then when the snow melted, there was water everywhere, so were there cl gray clouds of mosquitoes everywhere. We even put up the tent for lunch on some days. But even with all of those hardships, you know, it was just an amazing experience because we were out there in these mountains, in wild country, for 40 days. And there's just nothing else like it on Earth. It's certainly a challenge. Now, most of the mountains are in national parks, state parks, national wilderness, national forests. But the foothills, of course, have private development. What is the relationship of the different ownership of this right, land? Right. Yes, but most of the high country is public land. It's protected, national parks, wilderness, a lot of it national forest that's not wilderness, so uh, it's, not, it's not particularly well protected. But the lowlands typically are more private land. And so this is where the real threats to the Sierra are for the future. The, and the population growth of the mountain range is slated to tr the population is slated to triple by the year 2040. So most more that, people are going to have a tremendous impact. Way more people are coming and most of those will be living in the foothills region of the Sierra which is the least protected part. People for years regarded that as unimportant because it tended the high country tended to be where more people wanted to go for recreation and hiking and vacationing and all those kind of things. However, the foothills, the lower elevation, is critically important to wildlife of the Sierra, to most wildlife species. Deer, for example, the mule deer, native species there, they're plentiful, but they depend on high country for food in the summertime because it's wet and it's cool and green up there, but they have to get down to low elevations in the foothills in the winter. So they need long corridors of protected habitat, not just the national parks and wilderness areas Critical. at high elevation. So we need to do a better job of trying to link habitats together so that we have long continuous corridors that are needed by the life of these mountains. The other issue of overpopulation is simply too many people visiting. I know that Yosemite National Park had to work on crowd control and even wilderness areas you have to get a permit so that there aren't too many people in that wild area. That's right Yosemite is one of the most visited national parks and you can tell that when you go there in the summertime. You know there are about three million people a year who go there. The Park Service has done a remarkable job at managing that situation so that most people still enjoy their visit there. I'd rather go in the off season when there are not so many. But the really the biggest <clears throat> issue regarding population growth are the influences, the unavoidable influences from outside the region. For example, air pollution. The air pollution of urban and agricultural California wafts its way up the west slope of the mountains, up all of those canyons. You can see it as a gray cloud of smog. And you had to mention summertime. that in one of your photographs That's that right. what uh, we're looking at are not clouds, but smog. That's right. We can, uh, it's easily seen and photographed. And so it comes in, in dosages strong enough to kill sequoia trees. And closely related to that is the issue of global warming. The Scripps Institute predicts that the Sierra snowpack will decrease by 60 or more percent in this century. So that has profound effects not only on all the communities of life in this mountain range, but on the water supply of 30 million people all across California. So the, the population growth throughout the state, the resulting air pollution from cars, from industry, from agriculture, all of these things has a, a really serious effect on mountains that apparently are very far away and very protected, but they're not. They're inextricably tied 
to the rest of California and to everything that's happening to it. On the northern part of the mountain range is one of the most famous lakes in the United States, Lake Tahoe. And of course, you have sedimentation and pollution as a critical issue. Yeah. Right, right. Lake Tahoe is the second bluest lake in America. Only Crater Lake in Oregon has a bluer color. Mark Twain used to go for rowboat rides in Tahoe, and he called them balloon voyages because it was like floating on air. It was so clear, and you, you, when you go on that water in a canoe or a rowboat or a quiet craft and look down into that water, it's just a remarkable sight because you can see so deep into the water. However, the water's gradually turning from blue to green because it's filling with algae, which result from sedimentation of soil disturbance, from land development, from road construction, and also pollution from cars results in nitrogen that gets in the water that causes algae to bloom. So the lake's gradually turning from blue to green and getting more and more clouded. A group called the League to Save Lake Tahoe is working, trying to change that trend and doing a heroic effort. And here's the other, another big point I'd like to make, Nancy. The, the, when you look at the, consider the problems of this, well, first of all, considering the beauty and the amazing community of life there, there's no other place like it in the world. And you can get that sense by looking at your book, Luminous Mountains. Thank you. The, this range is under incomparable pressures, though, because of the population growth of this state and of America. Yet, there are dozens of organizations and thousands of people who are working on trying to solve these problems and doing an amazing job. The Sierra Nevada Alliance, for example, is a group that's only about 10 years old, but it has 90 member organizations that work for better stewardship, better care, better planning in this mountain range. The, the Nonprofit sure. volunteer activism is still critical to keep an eye on this place That's and right. to let the agencies involved know what the public wants, what That's conservationists right. believe is really essential to preserving and protecting. On the southern part, you have Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Park, and what are some of the other namesakes that we should be aware of? Well, the Kern River is the southernmost river, which is an amazing whitewater river. It begins on the flanks of Mount Whitney and flows south. The giant sequoia trees, of course, are in Sequoia and Kings Canyon parks and elsewhere. Largest living things in the world, amazingly adapted to where they are. The uh, Yosemite, of course, the uh, John Muir Wilderness runs for a long reach of the Sierra Nevada. The east side of the mountains is truly remarkable because it's the steepest side because it's a fault block mountain range. So earthquakes there have created an escarpment that rises a vertical mile. And uh, Mount Whitney, the highest mountain in 49 states, is there. And uh, Lake Tahoe in the north, the Feather River, Yuba River, American River is the most popular whitewater river in the west, is one of the northern Sierra rivers. So all of it is quite a lineup of amazing places. You do talk in your text about some of the threats and concerns, but yet you chose to just show the beauty of this place. Why that decision? Well, I really wanted to create an art book of photography here, Nancy. The, the, it is. Uh, you uh, succeeded. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's only been done a couple of times before, and, and those books are quite old and long out of print. There's been no modern-day book of really excellent photography. It takes no so book. long to get those pictures. It does, it does, it takes years. But uh, I also wanted to couple that with a text that not only described the place in a very personal way. I begin the book by talking about my very first trip to the mountains, which was as a hitchhiker in 1968. The first time I got out and into that wild country. So it has a very personal approach, yet I also wanted to convey a lot of informa interesting information about the natural history and about the important problems and issues affecting this mountain range. So blending these two together, the art form of photography, the uh, journalistic form of, of, of writing, uh, is something that really uh, suited my desires and my own personal ambitions. You know, I love to show a place to show people how valuable it is, and I love to write about a place to, to say and explain how important it is. So putting these two together, you know, the motivation of, the great motivation that I think beauty can result in, the, 
a motivation to protect a place because it's so special, just one of a kind. And coupled with the importance of knowing what's happening in these mountains and how important they are to us is what I was really shooting for. These mountains are important, not just to California, but truly for the world because of the biodiversity. They are as incredible as some of the other famous mountain ranges, the Himalayas or the Alps. That's right. That's right. They, as I said at the beginning, many people regard the Sierras as the greatest range in the country. Uh, it's the longest unbroken range. Conservation has a, its early history here. Many of the path-breaking uh, public policy decisions about public lands have been made here. Many of the finest efforts of citizen conservationists have happened here. So it's an incre incredibly important place for our entire nation, I think, not only because people from everywhere love to come here, not only because the resources of the Sierra, including its water, are so important to the rest of California and the West, but because the history of this range and the precedence of protecting it has been so important to other places as well. When I turn the pages, each picture seemed to be more stunning than the previous one. <laughs> and it would be difficult for me to say which I like the most. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that that's a problem with you, although people probably ask you which picture is your favorite. It must be every single one. But I'm thinking of when you're out there and trying to decide what to take a picture of, it seems like everything you look at is worthy of a photograph. It is, and it, or it certainly could be, Nancy, and so, uh, so that's where the photographer's eye comes in, you know, my particular slant on beauty or on, uh, on of curiosity, you know, what's the different angle of view, what's, what's the quintessential view for each part of the mountain range, I was always asking that question. So Northern Sierra, what do we really, should we really show here? The, uh, and you know, it's the deep fir forest up there. There's much more woodland in the north than in the south. So, you know, so I would show that for the north. In the Southern Sierra, it's more the high granite terrain. And so I photographed it. But I was always looking for just wonderful scenes with wonderful light. And there's plenty of both of those in the Sierra Nevada. Wildlife, are we ever going to see the reintroduction of the grizzly bear or some of the other species that have become extinct? I, I doubt if we'll see the grizzly bear because that would be such a controversial issue. But we have had success in reintroducing bighorn sheep, which uh, were nearly extinct in the Sierra. They were extinct in many regions of it. And on the east slope down in the Owens Valley, the tule elk That's right. have the made a wonderful comeback. That's right. Tule elk and... Uh, California condors in the very southern end of the mountain range is another reintroduction that's, that's uh, very exciting. And, and, uh, and there are a lot of species that are, that are imperiled but haven't been driven yet to extinction. For example, the mountain yellow-legged frog, tiny little creature that went unnoticed until the last few decades, but it was going extinct in the high country lakes because so many exotic non-native trout had been introduced. And that's a problem for the fish as well. Uh, that's right, that's right, for, for other native fish, yes. So there's, uh, you know, there are these, uh, old, the, the less glamorous species also are important. They have and, a role. They have a role in the, in the ecosystem for sure. And we've made some success in protecting those, but still a long way to go because there are so many threats that remain. Again, largely because of population growth in the state of California. You're going to continue to document this wonderful mountain range? Oh, I will. I'm sure I'll be going there forever and taking pictures of it forever, although my next book is called Trees and Forests of America. And it's a book that celebrates the great diversity of life in our forests all over this country. And I'm now beginning to take photos for the, uh, the next book after that, which will be Rivers of California. So it'll be a photo book of rivers all over the state. So many different species of trees. Are you going to try That's and right. include every one of them? No, no, there are too many. You know, there are six or seven hundred, and there'll be only two hundred <laughs> pictures in the book. That would be that would be a nice book. I don't think I have a chance of doing that. So again, I look for the really artistic shots. You know, the the scenes that I think really show forest, a particular forest type, in in the best way. I know you enjoy rafting the rivers. I enjoy it. You go canoeing on the rivers. It's a different view when you're in the middle That's of a right. river than when you're on the side of a river. And this is really one of the best ways to see the country, too. You know, traveling the rivers, 
is a remarkable way to see the landscape because you get away from the roads, you're on the water, the scene is ever changing. And of course the rivers are the lifelines too. So much of wildlife habitat is along the waterways. 70% of western wildlife depends on riverfronts in one form or another. So rivers are remarkably important and traveling rivers, aside from even the excitement and the fun of white water and the technical skill that's a wonderful challenge to face, is just a great way to see the country. I think you've documented some of the beautiful sights and the wildlife and the wild lands so that we can all appreciate and understand that these are areas that need preservation. Is that your ultimate goal? I th yes, yeah, I think it is, Nancy. That, that uh, I'm sure it is. You know, I do this work because I want people to understand how valuable these places are, how important they are, how threatened they are. And they're so threatened the by dams, pollution, people, Right, right. Activity. Mm -hmm. And if we don't know about these places, then we won't really care about them. And if we don't care about them, we won't take the steps necessary to protect them and to protect their value to us in all kinds of ways, including, as I mentioned, water supply. All of California is going to be in big trouble for water supply if this snowpack of the Sierra diminishes as much as it's predicted to do. And so there are just many reasons why we are intimately tied to this mountain range and so I hope that my work will make people more aware of that so that we so that we're become more committed to do what we need to do to protect this place for the future and even though I've seen this area close being out there I saw new views new images in your book and I'm so glad you cared enough to share this with everyone and thank you so very much for being my guest. All right Nancy it's great to be here thank you so much. I have been speaking with Tim Palmer author and nature photographer whose recent book is Luminous Mountains the Sierra Nevada of California and for viewers who would like more information please call or write. On behalf of our nonprofit organization Educational Communications I'm Nancy Perlman wishing you a natural unspoiled environment. Mm -hmm.